coming back to the front of the car has uh, led me to think about one of the things I'm quite proud of on this car. We were talking last time about the sort of parts that were getting done elsewhere uh, and almost straight after filming the last uh, episode the fuel tank arrived so that's a good place to start. Fuel tank was designed by us and fabricated by Bob at Concept Racing who we kind of give all of our sort of weld porn aluminium fabrication if you like just because he's uh, pretty good at that sort of thing. Um, so when we had the car bare metal we fabricated a plinth at the bottom there to sit the fuel tank onto. We kind of integ integrated the design where the fuel tank was going to sit and we integrated mounts into the shell for it. Then we did the actual drawings for the tank itself. It's a foam filled tank. It's got a VDO um, dip tube type sender in the, in the middle of the top, which has got a float in the middle for the feed to the gauge. Um, and then it's got a drop down pot in the middle under here, which drops into a recess that we actually incorporated into the body shell. Um, and that's only connected to the main part of the tank via some very small holes um, and that's that's sort of your main part of your anti-surge protection so when when the tank's reasonably low on fuel and you're cornering hard or braking accelerating hard it doesn't matter where the fuel sloshes in the tank that pot will always have a sort of reserve of fuel in it so there's no interruption to the fuel supply to the engine um, so that the pot then feeds this Bosch uh, fuel pump here Bosch 044 pump out via the filter and then out through these bulkhead fittings which run to the front of the car via the fuel rail and then back again um, and then the return goes back into the pot so the fuel's always being circulated and the return fuel feeds back into that pot making extra sure that that pot always has a reserve of fuel in it and then the foam filling on the tank obviously helps as well that just means there's literally like a, an open cell fuel resistant foam that fills the whole, fills the whole of that tank so when you're filling when you fill the tank with fuel effectively it's kind of absorbed into a large block of foam if you like which means that it can't quickly slosh around the tank as well which also helps with the anti-surge there are a couple of details on the design of the tank the we always designed it so that the tank would overhang the fuel pump and filter so we could do a trim panel off the back of here which then hides those fuel system components and that's what this this flange at the top here um, Part, part of it was to mount uh, this vent line here and the other, the other reason for that was so we could mount the trim panel. Uh, the venting we've done on the tank is uh, also a relevant thing to talk about. We've got a dash six spigot both sides at the front here and then a smaller dash three both sides at the front. And there's two reasons you need to vent the tank. One is as the fuel expands or contracts or you're actually using the fuel, obviously air needs to be, be able to go into the tank to take up the space as the fuel level drops. So the small vents in there are for that kind of in-use venting if you like. Uh, the other venting thing is literally just a filling issue. When you fill the tank, air can actually come out through the filler neck, but the problem you always have is it works fine when you jerry can it, but when you use a, a forecourt petrol station pump, the air rush up the neck actually clicks the pump out and you have, you have loads of problems with the pump clicking out if you don't vent it uh, higher than where the end of the nozzle is, which is why in, in most cars, particularly older cars, you'll see that there's a, a vent off the side of the filler neck a little way down from the cap, which is actually venting air from the tank out through the filler neck, but above the point of the end of the filler, of the nozzle of the gun. Um, and that's what we've done. We've got a big connection both sides here. They tee together and then they're attached to a, a spigot on the side of the filler neck here. So when you're actually filling, the, the end of your filler gun will be down here. So the air is venting out above that, but it's still coming out through the actual filler hole. And the reason we've got one both sides is so that 
regardless of even if you were filling the car on a slight slope, you would still be able to brim the tank completely without any fuel coming up and out through that vent. We wanted to actually use the original Escort um, cap. Uh, so we've got the very end of the original Escort filler neck and cut it off. Uh, that's mild steel, so we've then made the rest of the pipe in mild steel so we could weld it to that. And then that's actually been galvanised, which is the only bit on the car that's galvanised. Um, most of the um, mild steel parts are zinc electroplated. Galvanising is a dipping process. It's literally like you could imagine it as basically dipping something in molten uh, zinc. Um, so that definitely coats completely that pipe inside and out so you don't get any corrosion. I mean obviously we could obviously paint the outside as well but, but the inside wouldn't get any coating on it and that would mean that over time the inside of that pipe would, would rust. Batteries obviously in situ, we did the mounts for that when the, when the shell was a bare metal shell. I suppose I should touch on the reason the battery's here, May, mainly because the space in the engine bay is, is so seriously at a premium. There wouldn't really be room in there for a, the battery given that the dry sump tank's in the engine bay. Um, but as an added bonus, it's also helping with the weight distribution, gets a bit more weight at the back. Obviously on a, in a car like this, where you've got the engine and transmission at the front, the axle's a lot lighter than that, and you do end up with a bit more weight at the front than the back. So having a battery at the back, and the spare wheel will go the other side, we actually modified the side of the floor there so we can get a full-sized spare wheel, the same as all the other ones on the car, um, in there, which means you, you're still maintaining a reasonable side-to-side weight balance with the spare and the battery and shifting a bit more weight sort of towards the back of the car to help balance out the front the, the front to rear weight. The boot area is completely sealed from the, the cockpit of the car so there's no fuel risk of fuel vapour coming out into the car and also obviously if there was an accident then and the, that burst the fuel tank there's no risk of that getting into the front of the car or it would have to be a pretty serious accident for, it, for that to happen. The sort of complication to the bulkheading was that there's air outlet vents here at the back of the windscreen which, which help with the through flow of fresh air through the car. That air has to come out somewhere which is what these are um, and then there's actually a passageway under the scuttle here which leads to these holes on the parcel shelf. That just provided a little extra challenge on the bulkheading because if we literally bulkheaded straight, panelled straight across under here to block up these it would have blocked off that airflow so we've done we've basically done like a little um, sort of panel that creates a cavity if you like under there and actually ducts the air from here to here still but blocks it off completely from the boot area so that's that um, battery cable obviously then feeds through the car to the front uh, so I'll show you where that comes out So, although you can't see it, <laughs> the battery cable comes uh, through the car and then comes up to a, a little through bulkhead panel connector on the bulkhead behind the airbox there. Um, on the car side, it, it's, there's a, a second connection which splits off to feed the PDU. Um, and then on the engine bay side, there's a cable coming off from there to the starter motor and then from there to the alternator. But coming back to the front of the car, as uh, led me to think about one of the things I'm quite proud of on this car, which is the bonnet release. Which, on these early cars, was just a button in the grill. Um, on the later cars, they had a cable inside. I think we talked about this last time. In fact, we might have, might have seen it being done. But now we've had it black anodized, you can kind of see the, the full effect that it looks for all the world like it's just the normal late style grill with no bonnet release button, except this slat here releases the bonnet, which I thought was quite a, a neat little feature. Um, we've got the bonnet prop in now. Um, 
this is the later style arrangement where the prop actually attaches to the bonnet. Um, we've obviously had to make some reinforcement because this is into a carbon fibre bonnet. Uh, and then the receptacle down here, that's normally a spot welded part on the shell, but we're kind of always keen to avoid spot welded brackets like that on the shell. Because there's always, when you paint them, a, s a small shadowed area where you just couldn't get paint in there, which is always, always going to lead to corrosion. So we just put some threaded inserts in the shell there when it was, when it was a bare metal shell. Um, and now we've made that receiver in, it's that stainless steel that we've had powder coated. And then we've made a little nylon plinth that it sits on so that when the prop's actually in it, it's not resting directly onto the, the paintwork of the car and not chafing away at the paint there. It just sits onto that nylon pad. Um, so that's that. Uh, we've obviously got the strut brace in position now. And a more recent addition is the air box, which uh, Reverie have supplied the air box. The, the standard Cosworth backplate um, was too deep to actually fit the standard off-the-shelf uh, air box in. So we've had the backplate made shallower by Reverie um, so that we could keep the cause of backplate and, and use their air box in there. Uh, but that's turned out really nicely and then this perfectly points towards the spigot that we fabricated into the back of the front panel so there'll be a flexible pipe between there and there so you get cold airflow. We probably talked about this when it was bare metal but the, the, the front panel is almost completely blocked off apart from the gap where the radiator is and that round spigot there so you know all the air that comes through the grill is forced uh, either through the radiator or into the engine there and then i think the last time we talked about the tanks that we were just in in the process of making they're ready to go for anodizing now um, that's the braking clutch fluid there's a level sensor in the back i don't know if i mentioned that before we've got a, a threaded boss in the back that a float type level sensor sits in because we wanted to have um, level sensing for a warning light um, but didn't want an ugly cap with a wire trailing off over it so we've got a real nice um, knurled aluminium cap that goes on there um, but it's got a still got a level sensor in the back and then that side's the screen wash um, and that feeds down through the bulkhead into the main screen wash tank um, which I'll show you. So that screen wash tank then feeds down via a, quite a large pipe into this, which is a large screen wash tank, um, but we've obviously done it to serve two purposes. It also doubles as the footrest for the passenger. With the seat being so far back, you need to have a nice flat surface to rest your feet on on this side. Um, and we thought it was a, that's going to be black anodised, and by the time that's sort of black anodised with a black carpet around it, it's kind of like a subtle... Uh, nod almost to the navigator's footrests of the old rally cars back in the day but with it being black a little bit more knocked back and you know subtle um, the pump well, screen wash pump mounts on the back of that tank and then feeds up to a revised screen wash uh, jet arrangement that we've done so that feeds screen wash up to the uh, through the bulkhead through a pipe that goes to here and that feeds fluid out to these two plastic extrusions on each side uh, they're open on this end and closed on the other end and they have a row of very small pinholes in this back edge which are spaced between the slats of this scuttle panel um, so the screen wash actually jets out between the slats of the panel onto the screen so when you look at the car there isn't obviously any screen wash jets there but there's just a, a number of jets come out between those slats and then we've got uh, a, an updated wiper motor as well which we've done um, which sits inside the car if we go back down in here probably won't be able to see it but up under here is where the, the wiper motor always mounts in a Mark 1 Escort on the inside of the uh, scuttle so although we've got the, the basic mechanism uh, from the Escort we've transplanted a, a Mark 6, Mark 7 um, transit wiper motor onto there with a custom crank that we've put onto it um, so it just has a much more powerful uh, motor with uh, two speeds uh, and then we'll be controlling the intermittent from the PDU which I'll talk about in a bit. While we're in here, also worth saying we've got obviously the steering column in. The steering column is an Opel Manta steering column which we chose for a couple of reasons. A, it's a collapsible column which the original isn't 
um, and B, the switch gear on it, we absolutely love because it's, it's just a single stalk. This, this, the look of this stalk is exactly what we wanted for this car. It's kind of just lean and purposeful and it covers a lot of functions on just one stalk. So you've got indicate on here, you've got main beam, dip beam, half a pull is flash, turn it, three speed wipers, so you've got intermittent, slow, fast, and then on the end, push it for screen wash, then you've got a horn on the steering wheel. And with that combination of switch gear with the headlight switch, which is gonna sit in here, that pretty much covers almost all the functions um, that we need on just one switch. A pedal box is in, that's a, just an off-the-shelf uh, Mark 1 Escort bias pedal box. So the master cylinders now sit up under the dash here. You've got one for the clutch, one for the front brake circuit, and one for the rear brake circuit. And the bias is adjusted via a, what they call a balance bar, which adjusts the pivot point that the pedal, the pedal pushes between the two master cylinders, biasing the leverage towards front or rear, dependent on where you set it. Uh, and then we've also done the mounts for the ECU, the engine ECU, which sits over that side, sort of on the inside of the footwell panel, right up where you can't see it behind the dash. And then the PDU sits this side, and I'll talk a bit more about the PDU uh, in a bit. Um, but what I will do is just take this tank out and show a few more of the details of this on the bench. tank we fabricated this uh, here obviously done the dimple effect just a to make it look a bit more interesting and give a bit of a nod to that passenger footrest thing underside threaded bosses on the underside which we've done to the appropriate depth for the thickness of the carpet it's obviously bolted up from underneath um, two threaded bosses which were welded on the inside before we welded the tank up and that's where the screen wash pump mounts that's the outlet which goes to the screen watch pump, which has a tube on the inside of the tank, which obviously goes down to the bottom. So it's picking up fluid from the bottom. Uh, and then that's the spigot that goes up to the fill tank at the top. And this curious looking piece here is a small tube that comes out inside here. We're gonna be running a, a little tube off the back of that, which actually runs inside that main fill tube. So it actually lets the air flow out from in here into the top tank whilst you're filling it so it just fill it'll just fill smoothly without glugging down into the tank uh, and while we're here i'll show you some of the other stuff we've got these are the fascia panels we've done for the dash we've had these done in aluminium they've been water jet cut because the surface finish of the edges was going to be the, the final visible finish so we wanted them to be really nicely cut on the sides um, so that's the main dash fascia panel that sits in front of the driver um, you'll have a series of warning lights in these holes and obviously the speedo and taco in there. These, which we've had done for a while actually, but never showed you the instruments we've had done. These are done by Speed Hut in the States. Uh, and we asked, I asked Gordon and he gave us the go ahead to put his Gordon Murray design logo on them, just because I thought that would be a really, it's a nicely proportioned logo to fit on a gauge. So we've got those on the, on the taco and on the speedo. It's obviously a digital stepper motor drive on both of these hence why they're extremely shallow uh, and that will be your digital readout for your trip and your odometer the little warning lights that go into these holes they're just real simple and if you think back to when we were doing the drawings we just wanted a real kind of basic looking fascia that had almost a nod to kind of that 70s hi-fi look if you like um, so we've got just some basic LEDs with a little chrome bezel that almost replicates the, the bezel of the taco. And then we'll be getting these fascia panels anodized black. And then we're going to be engraving the wording on through that black anodizing back to the silver that, that shows you what the different warning lights do. So there'll be a main beam warning light, indicate telltales and warning lights for oil pressure, uh, alternator and something else. Can't remember what the last one would be. Brake, brake fluid. Um, same on this, this is the central panel, it has the auxiliary gauges in. We had these made 
not without any indication on the gauge of what they do because that will be engraved into the aluminium underneath each gauge so rather than it saying on the face of the gauge it's a nice little design feature that it's engraved underneath um, and then this piece slot goes into here and that has the control three of the controls there'll be the fan speed for the uh, heater the temperature control for the heater and the air direction for the heater which selects between feet uh, face demist or combination of those and then the last one will be the headlamp uh, switch that's also going to be black anodized um, and we'll also engrave onto these or in fact underneath here will be engraved what those controls do uh, so that's kind of the, the the fascia panels coming together we're just waiting at the moment because we want to send all of the things that are going to be anodized black off together um, so although we've got tons of it already, um, the bits we haven't got are the machined parts for the dry sump tank because we'll be, we'll be uh, anodising that black as well. We talked about, when I was over at the car, the PDU that's mounted in the footwell. Um, so what I'd quite like to do is show you a bit more detail of why we're using that and, and the programming of that. I'll come to the office. Come through to my office! <laughs> PDU is basically a, a little box like an ECU that's got three connectors on it. One is the main power feed in from the battery, and then there are two connectors, multi pin connectors. Uh, they're Deutsch Autosport connectors, which are like really, really high spec military spec connectors. One of them has got a large number, I think 50 odd pins, really small pins. And the other ones on this unit, which we're using, which is a 16 channel PDU, has got 16 larger pins on it. Um, and the connector with the large number is the input uh, or the is the input connector and the other one is the output connector and essentially on the output connector each pin on that plug feeds a wire which goes to a component on the car so that could be a light or it could be a motor whatever they're the, they're the output channels you've got battery voltage voltage being fed into the battery input on there and then on the input connector they are feeds in from anything like a switch on the car this is the software we're using a pdu from life racing by the way so you're basically faced with a blank grid you select which pdu you're using we've got a 16 channel one and you just presented with a blank screen like this simple as that and down the side here are the components you can add to this screen and you, in its most basic form you've got inputs and outputs here so I drag an input onto here. That represents now a physical input on the input connector. Let's say a horn circuit. That's one of the most basic circuits you could do. On here, my horn button on the on the car is connected to pin 15. So I select pin 15 and then drag an output over here. I know my horn's connected to pin 8 on the output connector, so I can select pin 8. Um, and then in its most simple form all i need to do is draw a line from there to there and then whenever i apply voltage or ground to pin 15 it will turn on the horn but if i then if i put a different component here if i put output let's say uh, side lights which is output one if i put output one here and drew the line to that this same input would turn on the side lights instead um, and then that's where it gets more exciting <laughs> is when you start going into more depth on it. The output properties, this is where the fusing comes into it. On the output properties, you can select the fusing ampage that you want that component to trip out at. This one, as the cars we're building go, this one's pretty straightforward. Some of the things we've done, they're just ridiculous amounts of electronics on them and you, it does get quite complicated. This one's reasonably straightforward because there just aren't that many electrical components. So I start by listing all the connectors that will connect to the main components of the electrical system, list the individual wires that will be there, and then from that work out what type of connector I'm going to need. Once I've got that list of the connectors in the car, and the main ones, which are the PDU input and output connectors, I then have got to work out every wire that connects these, these plugs to these plugs, 
list all those wires, um, and then it would be working out the length of those wires. So the, the, the next stage would be I'd do a rough schematic of where the wires will be rooted physically in the car, then go and measure up on the car exactly the length between all the different components. So then I can fill in my spreadsheet where there's a list of all the wires that I need, and then I can fill in the length of each of those wires, and then finally the gauge, the thickness that each of those wires needs to be to cope with the current that's going to be drawn. Uh, and then when we've done that, it comes to the easy bit. We just cut all the wires, label them all, <laughs> lay them all out, <laughs> heat shrink them all, put all the connectors on the ends, and hopefully it all works. Easy. <laughs> Next stage is exhaust that's going away next week to go to BTB. Um, they're going to make an exhaust to a spec we've kind of agreed between us. I've seen some of the work they've started, which looks amazing, so excited to see that when it comes back here with everything done. They're doing the manifold as well, so we're going to literally stick it on a transporter as it is now. They're going to build um, the entire manifold and system all the way front to back, which we'll hopefully get to see in the next episode and then it gets transported back here and we can carry on the build. In the meantime, the machining work on the dry sump tank components will be done. So we'll be able to crack on basically with the next phase, which is getting that oil system plumbing done. Because when we've got the exhaust done and the oil plumbing done, at that point we are getting pretty close to being able to fire it up. So, you know, hopefully that will be within a couple of months. Just randomly, what's on the hmm. wall up top? Is that just, ah, oh, okay. That is job lists and parts ordering lists. Uh, each, each, <laughs> each clipboard represents a car. They're basically lists I try and ignore and not do anything about. <laughs> <laughs>